Welcome to How I Killed My Mother and Other Confessions by the Mafia Hairdresser. This podcast is filled with episodes of my true confessions, harrowing, horrifying, and sometimes uplifting stories about my hair clients and celebrity friends, and of course, all about my mom issues. This is your host, John David, aka The Mafia Hairdresser, author of the novels Mafia Hairdresser and The Glow Stick Gods, all based on my fantastical, crazy life. You can listen to the serial podcast version of Novel 1 and Novel 2 here at The Mafia Hairdresser Chronicles and the hit podcast along with this one, How I Killed My Mother, available at MafiaHairdresser.com. And now on with this episode of How I Killed My Mother. This one's called Dog. My dog had me completely as long as she needed me. I could have been the Grinch with a millimeter sized heart, but when I saw her pleading Jet Browns begging me to let her out of that doggy jail cell in Long Beach, California, the dog pound, my heart grew in my chest and it sprouted wings. The instant we met, I vowed to take care of her forever or the rest of her life. I worked at John Don's Hair Designers on the semi-exclusive and not well-known island called Naples Island in Long Beach, California. Leslie was my boss. She's known as Brooke in the fictional version of Mafia Hairdresser, the book and the podcast. And she's not too much like that, but she's kind of like Brooke. Anywho, Leslie had worked for the original John Don and bought his salon when he retired. John Don and bought his salon when he retired. I worked long hours and I had a large clientele almost immediately, immediately after I began working for Leslie. I was um, quite educated as a cut and color specialist, but my own name, John David, was pretty close to the name of Leslie's salon, John Don's, so that certainly and admittedly helped me get to the top quickly at the young age of 20, which was when I first started working there. I worked for Leslie at John Don's off and on for over 11 years. She practically raised me professionally, and she also uh, mentored and mothered me to be a, uh, you know, a better man. Leslie was also a fervent dog owner, and when I was 27 years of age, she had secretly decided that I also needed to have a dog because I had been on a love striking out in the dating scene after um, breaking up from my high school sweetheart three years prior. Um, on most week weekdays at John Don's Hair Designers, I tried to cross off time on my daily work schedule so that I could ride my motorcycle off Naples Island to the beach in Belmont Shore nearby. I'd park my bike in the Granada um, parking lot, change into a bathing suit under a towel, and then I'd lay out for about a half hour by myself and meditate. One day, as I was about to run out the door, Leslie had stopped me by the front desk. Hold on, young man, Leslie said, holding up a manicured acrylic nail, single digit to halt me in my tracks. At first, I thought she was going to ask me to forfeit my break time to take on one of her more taxing clients because she overbooked herself again, or maybe she was going to reprimand me for some sort of Devo behavior, reprimand me for some sort of Devo behavior that I was known to exhibit back then. More than once, I was known to have sent away clients for, for requesting something stupid like just a trim or a hairstyle I thought was beneath my brilliant hair quaffing ability. But instead of talking about work, Leslie handed me a handwritten piece of paper that had a number on it, a code number. I'll never forget it. It was SW30. Instead of getting skin cancer, Leslie said, I want you to make the time to go to the pound on your break and check out a dog. She handed me the piece of paper that had the letters and the numbers SW3 and a zero. SW30 was the code um, a dog at the pound that Leslie wanted me to check out. See, Leslie had indeed been keeping an eye out for a dog for me, and she did that by regularly watching The Pet Place, a Long Beach cable access showcased ad adoptable dogs and cats from the local shelter. 
She had waited until she found a dog that she liked for me, and it was SW30. When she saw that dog on the TV, she knew it had to be mine. I didn't tell Leslie that I didn't want to go to the pound, nor did I even think to disobey her. Her request that I go down to the pound was a command, and I had enough respect for her that I didn't even blink. This was a woman who saw me through my most assholian of years as a young hairdresser, and she listened to all my ups and downs and demise regarding my eight-year relationship, and she even forgave me and took me back after I went off and owned my own Long Beach salon for four years and then came back. I told Leslie that I would check out SW30, but I also stated that it was just going to be a look-see. I wanted to appease her, but I also did not expect to take my dog home dog home that day. I hadn't even warmed my roommate Marcy that Leslie was thinking that I needed a dog of my own, let alone bring one home. Marcy and I had rented a house a block off the beach in Belmont Shore, and she had already had a dog, Max, a sweetheart, and two cats, Stella and Lulu, and we had a full house, even if we had a big backyard. Once I arrived at the Long Beach City Dog Pound, a female dog warden instantly knew about SW30, the dog I came to inquire about. She promptly acknowledged my inquiry by ushering me past a doorway, and she quickly began escorting me down the long aisle within the southwesterly ward of the dog prison. I kept my chin up and my eyes skyward. I knew enough not to look at any of the dogs that yipped for my attention from the insides of their six-foot high chain-link fenced in narrow cages, and I would have wanted to adopt all of them, because if I caught a glimpse of their pleading puppy eyes and doggy faces, I would be a mush. Numbers were fixed to the outsides of the cages, just above eye level, and I counted. 22, 24, 26. Yes, I got it. I was in the south western ward, and I was counting down to SW30, the number code Leslie had written down that matched the cage that held the mutt she wanted me to see. And I abruptly stopped a few feet in front of the cage with the engraved metal plate that was stamped 30 in the southwest building of the pound, SW30 at last. Taking a deep breath, I let my eyes scrape down the chain links to look at, for the very first time, my little Karen Terrier mix daughter. She certainly wasn't a purebred, but she was very pretty. She had light multicolored fur that looked soft instead of coarse like a purebred. And um, she was like a blonde toto is how people used to describe her. And she was silent in the cage, which was the opposite of all the other dogs. Through her veil of dog bangs, I caught a glimpse of her beseeching, hypnotic brown eyes that looked like they were lined with mascara. And she reminded me of a Margaret Keene painting or a Life magazine photograph of a cherubic orphan living on the devastating streets of a war-torn country. She looked at me and talked with her eyes. You have to be mine, this dog was saying to me. You have to be mine because I don't think that I can take it in here anymore. I have been through so much you don't even want to know. If you don't take me out of here, I will not live another day. I just know it. She looked directly at me. Daughter paid no mind to the dog warden who was at my, who was at my side. It was as if she knew the woman next to me was useless to her on the subject of her release. It would only be later that I learned that daughter was the sort of dog soul that either liked you or she didn't. If she did like you, she might have stayed in the same room you might have been in because something you were doing was of interesting or something to watch for her. But it was never to beg for food or out of loneliness or to keep you company. She was way too prideful and secure for that. If she didn't like you, you were either invisible to her or she might have peed on your foot. And I choked back my tears and did an immediate about face and began to walk run back to the main office house. I'll take that dog, I said sternly to the dog warden who had followed me quickly and who was caught by surprise. I was actually angry. In my head, I was um 
reconciling that I was just about to adopt my first dog as an adult and I hadn't discussed it with my roommate and I was half-heartedly cussing out Leslie in my head. I loved that dog. It was instant and it was a shock. I'm so glad, the dog warden woman said, surprised, but she had seen this before. Not so that surprised, I guess. That little dog seemed to smile as he ran away, like she knew you were going to take her. She's probably a little dirty now, I said, sniffing, as I made my way through the SW block back to the warden's desk. But her fur looks so pretty. After I condition it with a little of the nexus I got at home and style her, she'll be the Veronica Lake of dogs. And the woman's like, okay. Sorry, I always babble when I'm emotional or drunk, I said. That dog's very intelligent, she said. I should tell you, um, um... Well, people seem to want the more playful dogs. And I said, plebs. I'm just warning you, she said, because, well, never mind. And I was like, uh, what? Oh, nothing, she said. Once through the door and behind the counter, the dog warden stopped talking and began shuffling papers. And I took the stance on the other side of her counter and just stared at her before she grabbed my frozen hand, wrapped it around a pen, and made me sign things. I couldn't see clearly because my eyes were foggy with happy tears, and my mind was still racing. This was such a big step. And you're in luck, the warden said. She has had all of her shots because she was adopted twice before and brought back twice before. So you can take her home right now. I was like, what? And I cocked my head and I was astonished and apprehensively happy and reticent all at the same time. And reticent all at the same time. I thought you had to, you know, you know, get her fixed or something. Aren't there some kinds of adoption papers I have to fill out? And she was like, yeah, you just filled them out. You know, it happened so fast. I had no time to think. Not about why my dog was adopted twice. And not about why she was brought back twice. I had to think about how I was going to break it to my roommate that I would be coming home with another dog. She would have had serious reason to be concerned about introducing another pet into the house. What if Max, Stella, and Lulu didn't get along with my dog? This was something I learned that can happen. And then you have to move in with your boyfriend way too early. Whatever. That's another story. Um, this dog has already been spayed, the warden informed me. We do that for all the dogs on the pet place. But you'll have to take her today because this is her last day here. You understand. I was like, what? I had the sense to ask, why is it her last day? I was thinking there was a waiting period or I'd have to outbid someone else for my dog. And then, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know what I'm saying. Well, she's already been here for a while. The warden bounced her head back and forth from side to side as she talked. She's been adopted, you know, twice before and brought back, so... Wait, because people want stupid dogs? And the dog warden just shrugged. Okay, I said, so when can I come back and pick her up? And she's all like, now? Um, mm, can I pick her up after work? I get off at seven. We close at five after doubled again. And I took a personal offense. My dog was on the pet place, for God's sake, and there wasn't a line of people to adopt her. The whole world was stupid. And who would adopt a dog and then bring her back? And then I began to frickin' panic. There was something that needed to be brought up immediately before five o'clock. Uh, Ma'am, but I'm on a motorcycle, and I'm only on my lunch break. And she was like, okay then. Bubble had left, bubble had left, right, whatever. Suddenly, I screamed, demanded for her to go fetch my sensitive, intelligent dog from the prison area. Just go get my dog. And off the warden went. When the dog warden returned, I saw that she had escorted my dog out of her cell and down the hall to her office via a scrappy rope used as a leash that was loose-noosed around my dog's neck. 
She handed me the noose as a leash that was loose noosed around my dog's neck. She handed me the people end of the rope. It's complimentary, the warden said. I looked down at my dog. Even she rolled her eyes. The rope slipped off the dog's neck just as I began to lead her out of the office, and I didn't even notice. I was in my head, still shocked. But daughter did not run off. In fact, she had paid no mind to the temporary leash rope that was still uselessly being carried in my hand. She stayed well-heeled by me all the way to my parked motorcycle in the parking lot. A stupid dog would have run off, but not my smart dog. My dog knew she was coming home to the best home in the world and that we'd be best pals forever and ever and live together forever. We both just knew we were fated for each other. I only realized that daughter had no string attached when we got to my motorcycle in the par parking lot that I realized that I didn't know how I, I was going to get her back to the salon. What do you think? I asked her as we stood looking at my motorcycle. My dog looked at me like the situation was pretty self-explanatory. Duh, she said. I picked her up and I put her in one of my saddlebags and I zipped her up to her neck. Of course she was a perfect fit. And she rode back with me to the salon with her nose to the wind and a flapping tongue that hung out from her smug mug smile. We looked at each other many times while waiting at stoplights or at left hand turns and pedestrians, bike riders and car drivers and passengers alike looked at us. They all smiled at the new dog owner taking his dog for her first ride back to work and then home later on a motorcycle. It must have looked like we were the best of long-term pals. Over time, everyone in Long Beach, California knew JD and daughter, the motorcycle dog. We even rode in several parades. When I got back to the salon, Leslie was thrilled, <laughs> to say the least. She actually wept when she met the dog who waltzed right into John Don's full-service salon like she already owned the place with no leash. Like a mother, Leslie was happy that I was going to have unconditional love for a very long time. And it really was the perfect time in my life for a dog, this dog. This dog was with me for all of my single years. And of course, Mama Leslie had done right by me like she always had. I loved the best dog and we were the best of pals for a very, very long time. And I named her daughter after the dog of the man who mentored me in the hair biz. His toy poodle daughter had passed away of old age only a few months earlier. My friend was more than touched when I called and asked him if I could uh, make my dog his dog's namesake. But my friends, my roommate, and my family told me that naming my dog daughter, naming my dog daughter was way too gay, even for me. Some even threatened never to call her by that name. But daughter, the dog, and the name grew on everybody. Whether it was time to go outside for a walk and sniff, daughter always let me know with a forceful headbutt or a tug on my pant leg. She enjoyed getting pets until it seemed like it was annoying to her with only a simple look or a demanding stare. She also had a way to tell me how she didn't appreciate me leaving her too long whenever I got home late from work. She'd give me that cold shoulder she was famous for. Most dogs were a little more forward and vulgar with communication, and they used their paws. They barked, or they'd even defecate. But not Daughter. Daughter was never a clingy lap dog. She never licked my hand. She was an independent thing, and she was logical, demanding, but never needy. She was strong and confident, and she immediately took our partnership, partnership for granted. I was her bitch, and she knew it. Without a scratch or a whine, daughter would let me know what she wanted or what she did not want. Maybe all terriers, even terrier mixes, were like that sophisticated, I guess. After only about a week in her new home, she was the alpha of all of us. Me, Marcy, Max, Stella, and Lulu. Marcy forgave me for bringing another dog into her household, and she fell in love with daughter, too. But she was so curious as to how this particular dog could be so communicative and secure and demanding at the same time. So I actually called the pet place after the pound recommended that I do so. Marcy and I sought to find out about my dog's background, and it turns out that daughter had been roaming the streets of Los Angeles since birth. It took over a year for the dog catchers to capture her. She had been a dog without an owner for the first year of her life. A real street dog. 
And then I remembered the dog warden's almost said warning that my dog was smart and that there was something that she was something else she was about to tell me, but didn't. It must have been that daughter was a streetwise independent dog. I don't know why I wasn't sad or scared of the thought that my dog had come from the streets when I found out. I was more impressed. When I adopted her, I accepted the awful responsibility of alleviating any suffering that daughter might ever have to go through during her life as well as at the end of her lifespan. And we had many incidences when I, when I took her to the dreaded doctor to get a tooth pulled or got her treated for a parasite or stitches as a result from an imprudent scuffle with a, no, a larger, stupider dog. Now those scary or bad time memories are just as lovely as the memories of the more apparently happy events that we shared together. Like how she always sat still and, and let me blow dry her fluffy fur near a sunny window after a bath. I don't think anyone can trust people who don't love dogs or like dogs, especially daughter. She used her eyes to speak, and that could be intimidating to some of the people who met daughter. Now, daughter liked most of my friends, but there were a few she didn't. I want your dog to like me, they might have said. And I'd tell them to stop trying so hard. Don't reach down and pet her or talk baby talk to her. She really doesn't have respect for that shit. Your dog looks like she's listening to what I'm saying and acts like she doesn't like whatever I'm wearing. To that, I'd have to say I would agree. Daughter was always watching and listening to the people she didn't like. And she was listening to people she did like. And she was listening to hear the phrases like, well, I have to go or it's getting late. And I know she did not approve of half the shit I wore in the late 80s. And so she certainly wouldn't give someone else she didn't like a pass of half the shit I wore in the late 80s. And so she certainly wouldn't give someone else she didn't like a pass. Being a dog person with daughter made me a better person. My human love relationships did not make me a better person. In fact, some of those relationships left me bitter. Ever since the first and last time she begged me with all her soul from the inside of that doggy jail, I had been able to understand her like I will never understand people. Our friendship was more than a fair relationship, something I would never say about my human relationships. She was at my side through big moves to different cities and a different country And daughter was there for all those years when there were a lot of relationships in those different cities and and countries. Daughter was the only constant, and it was daughter to the rescue whenever those relationships ended. She was always the one who restored my active on relationships, especially after she peed on a couple of my boyfriend's feet or belongings. One particular doomed relationship of note was when I uprooted daughter and me and we moved to Canada to be with a younger man I fell in love with at a rave party in Miami. After two years of long distance dating and immediately after daughter and I moved in with him, the man informed me that he was allergic to her. So she had to sleep at night in the hallway and not at the foot of the bed, which had been her place for the previous 15 years she and I had been together. To give my Canadian some credit, he simply did not know how to have a real pet and was afraid of daughter and her soulful eyes. According to his growing up on a farm, animals only communicated by bleeding, barking, mooing, and oinking to convey they were uncomfortable, hungry, or even acknowledged his presence. I hungry or even acknowledged his presence. I tried to get her to like my boyfriend, but if daughter acknowledged him at all, she would only just stare at him as if she couldn't believe her own eyes that he had put on such a tragic outfit combination. Maybe she was asking him, so you're leaving when? It didn't help that he kept trying to win her over by talking baby talk to her or bringing her treats like the ones from Canada that were actually made into moose shapes. She didn't eat anything he bought for her. That's the way terriers are, I kept trying to tell him. They're they're smart and they're finicky. Just don't talk baby talk to her. She knows what you're saying. Daughter hates baby talk. She's a dog, he would say. She's a spoiled city dog who doesn't like dog food. 
But that boyfriend continued to talk baby talk to her. Thanks. He's an American, I kept telling her. And she only eats things that look processed, like jerky treats and pepperonis and science diet. She's never even seen a moose to know if she even wanted to taste one. I suppose she told you that, he'd say. Well, neither of us Americans in the room had to say anything. He could see it in mine and daughter's eyes. Of course she could talk. Duh. And she continually communicated to us both that she had no use for him. After that breakup and a return to our latest home city, Chicago, again, we had the best three years of daughter's life. I had felt so guilty that I dragged her through that last relationship that I promised her that I would take her to the dog park by my new apartment, rain, snow, or sunshine, for one hour a day. As a result, she became more socialized and even more secure. And as an old lady, she came into her own person, if you will. In that park, Washington Park Square in the Gold Coast of Chicago, daughter made plenty of dog friends who were young and old. She taught the young pups how to play and behave, and she stopped fights between the more frisky dogs, and she was like the sweet and firm granny that everyone loved and no one could get away with shit from anything in front of her. Daughter also attracted so many new friends to me as well. Some of those people became my new posse and are still my best friends today. We will always have daughter to thank for meeting each other. As I said, those three and a half years were the best of her life. She was the life of the party and the center of my universe, and she was certainly the most popular girl in the park. On the last day of her life, she woke with a little bit of a girl in the park. On the last day of her life, she woke with a little bit of an arthritic pain, and she had an accident on the floor. I had already made an appointment with her vet to take a cab north the three miles to uptown from downtown at 3 p.m. that day. I was just going alone to talk to her doctor about pain meds for her. Um, I did not plan to take her because she was not um, suffering from the pain very much up until that morning. Um, she had only just begun to get a little rusty every once in a while. I think it was arthritis. When she wet the carpet that morning, daughter knew I wouldn't scold her, but she looked at me as if to say, really? Is this what getting old is all about? She looked mad, and I could tell that she wanted nothing to do with this age thing anymore. She hadn't had too many old episodes leading up to that day, but this magic. I didn't know it at the time, but it was her heart. It was going. She was going. But my heart, if not my head, was prepared. That was the first and only day that I carried her to the park across the street. We were an hour early for our regular 8 to 9 a.m. peeps. Um, so we got to see the 7 to 8 a.m.ers because after her accident, we didn't dwaddle. We loved seeing the seven to eighters, um, but we also stayed around to hang out with the seven to eight, I mean, the later ones. Two hours of dog park normally would have been a treat for, for the both of us, but that day it was a gift and not just for the two of us, but for our park friends. They got to say goodbye. Daughter didn't turn around and play as she didn't really do much of that anyway. Play as she didn't really do much of that anyway. She would usually just walk around and observe and rule her fellow subjects in the park. Of course, she sniffed and marked a few bushes. But that day during the first hour, all Daughter did was stand still, like a sentry, while all the other dogs came up to sniff noses with her as if they always did to pay their respects to their granny. It was always like she was the Pope or the Queen, and all her royal followers or worshippers were there to kiss her ring, and then off they'd go on. But that day, ugh, the reactions of the other dogs were different. They said their hellos and paid their respects, but then their heads went down when they somberly walked away. 
One of the seven to eight a.m. or people had tears in her eyes and said, "Is she saying goodbye?" In her eyes and said, "Is she saying goodbye?" I think so," I said calmly. I had never seen anything like the animal behavior we were all witnessing. It certainly looked like every dog that came up to her smelled death coming on, and they bowed their heads in respect. By the time our eight to nine a.m. regulars began to trickle in, Daughter Splooge plopped onto the pavement. She had been standing and receiving for over a full hour. So I scooped her up and held her in my arms like a baby, and that was never allowed before. Her letting me hold her like that, but she let her head loll over my arm for the next hour, and from her human cradle, she continued to say her goodbyes to the dog friends she had come to mother. The park people friends were shocked and awed to see such a touching moment as this: their own dogs walking up to my daughter in my arms. At the time, I don't think I was fully letting the emotion of the situation sink in. I do that when things become apparent that they may become、uh, too emotional of a situation in front of people. I process sadness and loss by myself, and usually weeks or months after the situations. I was strong, like daughter would have wanted me to be. And I focused on the other people's feelings and their dogs. And my dog, of course, I paid lots of attention to her. I was thankful that I had until 3 p.m. to go to the vet. I had an entire day to see if daughter's condition reversed. Either way, I decided that morning that I would take her to the vet with me. I had time to make sure in my own mind that daughter was ready. I borrowed one of our park friends' cars, and I drove through McDonald's and bought daughter a whole hamburger. Friends' cars, and I drove through McDonald's and bought daughter a whole hamburger, which she ate on the way to the vet, and she appreciated that treat. A doggy smile from the passenger seat beamed at me as she lay while her breathing slowed. I didn't cry. We weren't done yet. The vet, Doctor Dickus, at Uptown Animal Hospital, came out to the waiting area to greet what he thought was only going to be me. Oh, he said, eyeing daughter slumped in my arms. I see. That was all that was said. I nodded. Again, no words. It was her time. Daughter liked Doctor Dickus, but like most dogs. Any other time, she would have liked to be anywhere but at the vet's office. She just glanced up at him and gave him a few wags. There was nothing for her to say either. Leave or stay at the vet's office. She just knew she was tired of everything. The last gift I received from daughter was that long stare full of love, which assured me that she was indeed ready. <laughs> That last day was the day that her heart could no longer beat fast enough for her. It was also the day that she picked to go and leave me. I was only there to make that easy for her. Most dog people and dogs don't ever get to be so lucky as to know for sure that it's time, and I am so very thankful. My face was so close to hers when she told me that she was mine, and I was hers, and that I was hers, and that she took her last breath. I just want to say thank you, daughter. I really am a better person. I'm a better person because of you. I know you have looked out for me, and you are looking out after the dogs. Thank you for that too. I love you so much. Thanks for listening. New episodes drop most every Monday. To know more about me, John David, or read my books, as well as listen to the podcast episodes of Mafia Hairdresser, The Glow Stick Gods, John David and Goliath, or more episodes of How I Killed My Mother, just go to mafiahairdresser dot com. Don't forget to like and subscribe and comment at will. I am Mafia Hairdresser on social media.